Okay, ready? Are you Len Antares who runs Historic Investments? I can be Len Antares from Historic Investments. Welcome, guys. This is Len Antares from Historic <laughs> Investments. But no, this is a in the column from Forgotten Weapons. Yes. Is that how we're... Okay. I think we should start. Okay. Ian, you were going to ask me some questions. <laughs>
collectors and maybe investors might like down the road. Okay. See, I think there is, I think people are always dubious about the the value, the, the cultural value, I guess, or the collectible value of stuff that is currently available. Like if it's being made today, well, it can't really be much of a collectible, right? But then right. when those guns are out of production and all of a sudden they get start getting hard to find, well, oh, now there's some exclusivity to this. Now there's some interest in it. And I think that's an area, to me, that's where Star is going to, I think, pick up more of its collectible interest and gain in value at least a bit. I think Star has a long road to be accepted as a top tier collectible brand. But we're seeing this with a lot of like the, the nine millimeter double stack service pistols from the 70s and 80s, where they were in, when they were in production, no one really cared all that much because, well, it's not as good as a, as a Beretta or it's not as good as a Colt or I just want a 1911 instead. Who wants all that junky nine millimeter crap? But now you've got Italian brands, the, um, uh, the Bernadelli's, the yeah, Benelli's, the Benelli's as well, yeah. uh, Stars, a, a lot of the, well, even some of the, the German guns, uh, Walther P88, some of the, the Belgian stuff, the, the interest, like the, the Browning And, and the PDAs. HMK stuff. Yeah. Especially P9, the P7s, P7. the P8s, the, the M13s. I mean, those prices are just skyrocketing. And, and actually, I, I'm probably too old. I'm not sure I understand it. But the, <laughs> but the point of this video is not that I understand it. The question is really, what are, what are reasonable predictions? So one of my predictions is some of these scarcer stars will do well. So anyway, that's kind of a generational thing. You know, maybe you're kind of priced out of the market with, uh, with some of the Colts and Winchesters. We're, we're largely confining our discussion here to handguns. So um, yeah. uh, why don't we just kind of focus on the Colts? But buying Colts, that's a very, very mature market. We're not talking about you're stumbling onto something dirt cheap. We're talking about buying something at market value whose value in 10 years will outpace its competitors. So... Um, we've kind of talked about the stars. I think the next thing maybe we can talk about, we've heard about Russia an awful lot. I mean, Russia has yes. always been one of our, you know, nasty competitors, whether it be in the Cold War right now, it's maybe more than a competitor as uh, Russia has um, entered and is, um, it's battling, it's what it's special military operations. It's not a war, special military operations in the Ukraine. We hear about Russia every day. And one thing that you guys, if you, if you don't already know, you can't import any more Russian firearms. I mean, that's been German verboten and for a few years now. So these are not available, even if they are being made in Russia. You can't import them. It's probably not going to change anytime soon, if ever. And kind of the, one of the nicer subsets, I mean, you, you guys might like those Margolin target pistols. They've appreciated very nicely okay. in the last five years. And they're, they're really nice. They've got a wooden case and all kinds of accessories. But if you're like me, you kind of like some of the military pistols. And I think buying some of these Russian Makarovs is uh, kind of a hidden gem now amongst some of the surplus guns um, that are offered on the market. You find them some from some time to time on websites, you find them in gun broker, you find them privately, and they're still priced pretty reasonably. And for some of you guys who, for example, like complete rigs, whether it's a broom handle with a matching stock or a Luger with two matching magazines, you can buy Makarovs with two matching magazines, original finish, at a really reasonable price, which I can't imagine will still be the case in another 10 years. There's definitely a situation where when something is being imported or was fairly recently imported, all of the, the similar guns kind of blend together. And you'll see it with Makarovs, like in this case, where there were Chinese and Bulgarian and East German ones imported, and you couldn't import the Russian ones, but the Russian is the original, you know, the original to me. Ones, they kind of scooted in well, there. The most desirable somehow, yeah. Makarov to have would be a Russian one. Absolutely. Um, and then after that, some of the other countries, especially the right. ones with low production, but you couldn't get a Russian because they were unable, you couldn't legally import them. Well, some of them snuck in, misidentified in this case as East German ones. So they actually have right. import markings that say German. German. Uh, but they are, in fact, Ishev's Russian Makarovs. And, and, and once they're in the country, oh, then they're legal. Doesn't matter. Because they're fine and they're, they're actually on the ATF CNR list. Right. 
Yeah, which they is were so like hard impressive. to get in. You couldn't bring them in, <laughs> but once they're in, they're CNR guns. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. But what's neat about them is the prices are not that much higher than any other Makarov that's out there. You saw the uh, same thing. Maybe a little bit. Well, they're a little higher, little but little. not out of... Uh, they're held. The prices are held down by the prices of Chinese, Bulgarian, exactly. East German. You saw the same thing for a long time with Finnish Mosins. When there were just boatloads of Mosin Nagants coming into the country, that included a relatively small number of some of the really scarce Finnish models that are far more desirable, far more collectible and valuable, but the, the prices of those Finnish guns was held down by all of the Russian stuff that was available at the same time. Now that the, the imports are five years plus behind us, the Finnish stuff has really started to float up above the Russian guns in price. If, and, and the more, opportunity... More like rocket up, not float up. Well, yeah. I mean, they've just exploded in terms of Some value. Some of them have, yeah. yeah. The time to now, get Now that, they're almost like buying Winchesters, by the way. Uh, they're not that well, bad. Well, okay. Not that bad. A low-end Winchester. Yet, yeah. Okay. But the time to get the really unusual, interesting, like the cream of the crop patterns was during the importation. And we're at the tail end of that for Makarovs. Like, you still have the prices of the Russian stuff being held down by people who don't really recognize the difference. Exactly. It doesn't look... You know, from 10 feet away, it doesn't look much different. But that's the place where the discerning collector can say, that's the one that's going to be more desirable in the future. Right. And, and especially and if you it. can find them, original finish, two matching magazines and a holster. Yeah. That's what collectors are going to be looking for downstream. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let, let's kind of move on. Um, yeah. What about some of the Chinese guns? You have just written a book on uh, Chinese Warlord pistols. Yes, I have, and a lot of them came from your collection. I believe you no, are actually you, mentioned. Is that, is that right? I believe you're mentioned in the front of that book. Okay, so, so we both worked on it. So uh, we both have like a hidden, you like, know, some a vested interest in this. That but pistol that, is in the book. This this pistol is in the book. So this is for demonstration. Of course, and, it's, it's absolutely well, not for sale. Right? There's no vested interest because no. I couldn't pry that gun out of your grimy hands. Well, no one else is going well, to be able okay, to either. Come on now, that, that, uh, right. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, what about Chinese warlord guns or just Chinese guns in general? Okay, Chinese guns are now, they're difficult to find. Warlord pistols are really tough. So I don't know, they're, they're, they're kind of bizarre guns. They're not mainstream guns. But again, if you really want guns that are going to kind of float above the pack, why would you get a Chinese Warlord gun? It's not because these are accurate gun. It's not because these have got fine-tuned trigger. It's but the thing not because they're necessarily even safe to fire. And they might not even be safe to fire. <laughs> Somewhere. I Ex bet that one is. Ex exactly. But, you know, the thing is, there's a new book out there. There's new collector interest. So a lot of people who buy guns, they buy them for investment. A lot of people, a lot of collectors... They have two, three, five guns that they might shoot on a regular basis, but they kind of like the stuff. And some of it's just to show their buddies. Some of it is just for pride of ownership. But for some of them, like these Chinese guns, they're really novel. You take one of these Chinese guns out with gibberish markings, you show your buddies or your significant other, and they'll say, what is this? I've never seen one before. And then you have the chance to puff out your chest and expound on it. And you can pull out Ian's book, and you can point to, see, this one's just like it. You can't say it's like it, because no two Chinese guns are ever the same. No. Except for the very few that were made from major arsenals. But that's, those guns are in the minority. But these are just fascinating guns. You know, the time to, to really buy is when there's a lot of new information that's just being unveiled to you. And... Um, I think buying Chinese guns now, right now, it's a good moment in time. Ten years from now, it'll be a, more of a mature market. I don't know if another book's going to come out on Chinese warlord guns or Chinese guns in general. But right now, there's not a good reference. A good reference is coming out. That's a, that's a different opportunity for people to buy things for investment. There's a psychological aspect that people are interested in things that they have a connection to, that they know something about, more so than something that's just a complete blank slate. And so I think we see that in a lot of areas where publishing of new books has driven up interest in specific areas. And I know you're all thinking French rifles. With I was my thinking other French rifles. In fact, and we, that, we had a talk earlier. I said, who in the world would want French rifles? <laughs> 
And in fact, we even had a conversation about how many books to print. Yes. Well, uh, who in the world would want record, Spanish pistols? For the record, I was wrong on almost <laughs> everything I told Ian in terms of the numbers to print and in terms of the values of Spanish or French, excuse me, <laughs> French rifles, but, um, but in a good way. Okay, and, and one of my predictions so, is the same thing is going to happen to some of the Chinese warlord pistols. This has also happened with Italian firearms. Right. There have been a couple really good books that have come out on Carcanos and other Italian firearms. And being able to understand what the differences are between variations and the significance of patterns and markings and what role different specific examples played in history really, I think, drives a collector interest because when people know more about the subject, they can become more invested in it, in an emo emotionally invested, not just financially invested. Absolutely, and especially when there's some you know cultural overlies too. Yeah, so I think in general, like you look at the number of books that are printed on Luger's and German firearms. Right, another book it, is not going to change the baseline of collector interest. Right. The Luger market's a very mature Luger, which is great. If you like Luger's, and I like Luger's, you like Luger's too. I know we both have a few of they're them. They're okay. You know, but basically, if the market goes up, the Lugers will join them. There's nothing to prompt the Luger market from moving ahead of the pack. I would say it's already happened. It's already happened. Back and in, in the... fact, it's kind of backing off a little bit. So yeah. that's not really where you want to be if you're buying guns for investment. You want to be ahead of the curve, not behind it. Yeah. So that kind of brings us to the new book, right? You were also involved in that project. I guess I was too, wasn't yeah, I? Yeah, we both We both were sort of forget about somewhat, it. But... Neither of us were primary yeah, uh, the primary drivers, but uh, the Vickers Guidebook on SIG. Right. Um, which, of course, brings up. So then the question is, you know, everyone's heard about SIG. Everyone now has heard about SIG Sauer. The new SIG Sauer is the current military weapon of choice, the current item of choice for the United States, whether it's the M17 or the more compact Model 18. And as you may or may not know, somewhere between 3,500 and 5,000 of the Model 17s were, I don't want to say deaccessioned, but were taken back by SIG and replaced with the guns having a blue small parts. And, and that's a story I think maybe beyond the scope of this video. But the, the fact is, this is an, an, almost an unprecedented opportunity for, for us as collectors to buy a gun, which is a current issue military sidearm. You're not buying a commemorative. You're not buying a gussied up thing with a plaque behind a you know, a glass, um, you know, a glass or mirrored box, you're actually buying a gun that had been issued and used by military troops. It was deaccessioned, unlike the Colt um, Model 45, where most of the Marine Corps guns had a big X through the USMC, which in my opinion really disfigured them. The rare guns, the original guns, don't get me wrong, but that's not like these Model 17s. You're getting them exactly as were used by the military. And 35, whether it's 3,500 or 5,000, it's not very many. And in 10 years, these guns could very easily double in money. And if we kind of look at comparables, a doubling money is like almost a no-brainer. And I'll go on record as saying that. But again, I was wrong many times before. I may be wrong on this, but I don't think so because these things now are selling at at least one auction house for about twice of what they, they usually are offered for in the open market. So I think that's a trend that'll continue specifically if you like SIGs, which in my opinion is the best investment one. I'd go with the Model 17. I don't think that any of the uh, M18s have been uh, deaccessioned, at least they, none of the military ones have. They talked about doing it, but I haven't seen any of it right, actually yeah. happen yet. And then usually if you're a collector, and this is kind of a spin-off, so it's a little bit of a stretch, if you buy one gun, if you're a collector, you kind of get interested in the history and you say, okay, well, what was the kind of the progenitor? What was the forerunner? And it might not be an immediate technical forerunner, but what was the gun that actually put SIG on the map? And those are the SIG military guns, the P-49s, because most people consider those the best military pistol that was ever made. That means, yes, cult aficionados, better than the Colt. You ask, what is the best military pistol in the world? Most people would point to the P-49. So if there's some added interest in the Sig Sauer Model 17, I think there's going to be some spillover interest into the P-49s. But again, that's my take. What do you think, Ian? 
I think what makes the the M17s really interesting is that they are, in, as you said, legit U.S. military surplus. That used to be not that uncommon of a thing. You know, post World War II, all the military arms were basically available as surplus. Today, we have changes in machine gun policy, and most military arms are full auto. You can't go get a surplus M4 carbine because it was a machine gun. Now, some of you guys in Europe do have surplus M16A1s that came out of Vietnam. I've seen a lot of those floating around Europe, and that's something that would sell like hotcakes in the United States. A lot of people would love to have those, but you just can't in the U.S. And the examples of times when you can get actual American Army surplus that's current, basically current issue, are really, really limited. So you mentioned the right. Colt M45s, the 1911s. That's one example, and we saw those go way up in price the moment they were you know, as soon as the retail side sells out, there they go. Um, the same thing will happen, has already happened to a, a significant extent with the M17s, but will continue to. Um, there were a couple of different Delta guns. There were some STI 40 caliber Deltas that came out and went poof like that. There were some Delta AR-10s or SR-25s where they sold just the uppers. Uh, Knights paired surplus SR Delta 4s SR-25 uppers with new lowers that were semi-auto. Those went out on the commercial market and went, they're even, they're, I think, the craziest, most but, expensive of the bunch. But, but those are really kind of a handful of guns. I yeah, mean, there are more of the, these than any that of I'm those. Making, um, what I'm trying to make is that, guys, these are available. They're available now, and they're yeah. available even at the inflated prices compared to when they were originally released a few years ago. They're still not much more expensive than a current production gun, and you're getting a real piece of, you're getting real collectible and a real piece of military history. And most of these are truly in excellent condition. Now, yeah. another thing that's sort of in that same realm conversationally are those uh, are the Bretas that are still in use, but we really don't know if they're going to be um, deaccessioned and offered commercially at all. I mean, right now, just a handful of guns are you know, have been offered through um, some of the more prestigious auction houses at really high prices. But if the market gets flooded, you know, through the DCM or, you know, whatever the equivalent is now, you know, right. with, you know, 20,000 or 50,000 Berettas, that price might change. But as soon as they're offered, that would be the time to get them, not, you know, five years later. Yeah, that's always one of the risks of something that's, if it's rare and in limited quantities, it's going to be desirable, all else being equal. But you never know if a whole smorgasbord of them is going to show up. SKSs were like that. Right. And SKS was a really rare exotic firearm for a very long time. And then the wall came down. And then within a you know, few years later, there are just container loads of SKSs being dumped in the U.S. for 49 bucks. And don't you wish we both bought several container well, loads now? Uh, yes and no. Maybe one like, container load. The storage in, inflation, might be inflation has... The, the, the value difference is not as much as the cash dollar value, right. dollar right. number makes it sound like, necessarily. Um, but in any event, I think we probably uh, bored these people to, yes, to death, I okay? So. And uh, maybe next time you'll come up with your, your choice of uh, best investment arms, and, and then, I, then, I, then I can courteously uh, disagree with you. All Berthiers. Right, all Berthiers. Well, there you <laughs> go. The we, we can start to disagree <laughs> on that right now. But on that note, listen, guys, thank you very much, and um, thanks for hearing me out. All right. Thanks for watching.